She's running Documenta 2012. Who of you, who of you know what Documenta is? Ah, so, so um, who will come to the next Documenta? Ah, good. So, she made you now to that you all come. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Steffi. It's really wonderful. And thank you, Leonie, also, Casanova, whose wonderful voice uh, preceded this very, maybe, dull talk by someone involved in, in contemporary art. Uh, I was thinking when I was watching her uh, what it might feel like to, to, to embody emotions like that singing. Uh, so thank you very much. And also, I'd like to thank DLD, uh, Steffi, of course, Czerny, Maria Furtwängler Boda, and Marcel Reichardt for the kind invitation. I've brought Darcy with me. And I must say that this morning, I don't know if she's here, Lee Edelkurt, but if she is here, I want to thank her for psychoanalyzing me and a ton of other uh, people in the art world because indeed, many of the things that she said this morning uh, are true. I think they're 100% correct analysis of, of what's going on. Um, and therefore, perhaps what I will say is a little bit counterpoint to that because I want to tell you why it's that way. You know, one thing is to say there is this trend. Another th for example, animals. Another thing to say why. Uh, so that's Okay, so um, I have an hour and a half long paper, but I will not read it, of course, <laughs> given that we have been uh, uh, trying to contain a conference in two days and have so many interesting voices from different fields. But uh, I will read snippets of it, and therefore what you, what you get is actually a fragmented uncoherent and a bad summary. Uh, so for those of you who do not know Documenta, Documenta is, is that gonna be a PowerPoint somewhere eventually? W when you get it, you can just turn it on. Should I do something like this? No. Yeah. Um, anyway, it'll come on. So Documenta is uh, an honor to be leading indeed uh, I am the second woman uh, to direct the Documenta. The first woman was Catherine David in 1997. Uh, and we are now at the 13th, the 13th Documenta. And therefore, it's a very, uh, I doubled the statistics of women uh, directing Documenta in one go. Uh, and therefore, it's also a responsibility even more as a woman towards my colleagues, my fellow colleagues around the world who are working in art. But as in many um, other fields, uh, women are generally in curator positions and they're rarely in um, directorship positions. So you have Tate Modern is Nick Sirota and you have Pompidou is Pacquemont and so on and so forth. Glenn, our great friend at MoMA is a man and so on. But you often have the second in command in museums being a woman. And in fact, I did lead um, the Castello di Rivoli, which was one of the few institutions that has a history of uh, women directors. Prior to me was uh, Ida Gianelli, and therefore, perhaps this brought me towards, towards the Documenta. So Documenta is, uh, what you see behind me is a photograph of the opening of the first Documenta in 1959. It's a periodic exhibition of art which began as a proposal by Arnold Bode in the immediate post-Second World War period in Kassel, Germany. And it opened first in 1955 as an attempt to reestablish culture and the visual arts as a primary focus of society. And therefore to reconnect Germany with the field of international art at the time after the trauma of the World War, of the Second World, World War. Since then, generally every five years, it has become both an exhibition of contemporary art, but mostly a moment of reflection 
the tribe, all of us, the artists, the curators, the thinkers, the writers from all over the world gather every five years. It's, it's our space. Um, and it has uh, become, therefore, also a moment of reflection on the relation between art and society. And the last edition of Documenta drew over 750,000 visitors from all over the world in 100 days, which makes it the key art event in our uh, universe. However, Documenta is more than an exhibition, and it's not exactly an exhibition. Its DNA is different from the other international exhibitions, such as the Venice Biennale and so on, mainly because it did not emerge as a development of the 19th century trade fairs or world fairs of the colonial period, bringing to the old European centers the marvels of the world. It emerged, on the other hand, from the trauma which was just mentioned, and within a very particular space, the space where collapse and recovery are articulated. It emerged also at the juncture of where art is felt to be of the utmost importance as an international common language and world of shared ideals and hopes, which implies that art indeed has a major role to play in social processes of reconstruction, civil society building, healing and recovery, as well as um, at the juncture between that and a conception and notion of art as the most useless of all possible activities. Therefore, within the legacy of the notion of modernism and the autonomy of the modernist artwork, which was dominant up until the 1950s and the mid-1960s. At the juncture of these two spheres, where the social role of art and the autonomous field of art meet, lay les enjeux de l'après-guerre and the politics of the West in the mid 20th century for better and for worse. By the way, a small comment on one of the speeches of this morning, fortunately not by a woman. Um, I know many feminists who wear the veil <laughs> in various parts of the world. Um, so it's a much more complex discussion and I suggest reading Sabah Mahmoud on questions of how the veil is used uh, in a very conservative way in anti-Islamic discourses. Any case, um, we'll skip that. That's another lecture. Um, over the years, and especially from Documenta II onwards, which was in 1959, a crucial year, we're in the middle of the Cold War, Documenta came to signify, in the context of Western Europe, a place in which freedom of expression could be achieved even within the Cold War policies towards the Eastern Bloc. More recently, since 1997, and in, indeed the Documenta 10, which was directed by the only woman predecessor, is Darcy around? Yes, he's there. Uh, it has been a platform for a critique of Eurocentricism and for the assertion that exhibition making and exhibition viewing is also a discursive and a political practice. In contrast to other periodic international exhibitions, it's views, viewed today in our imaginary system as having a strong theoretical grounding and a sense of the urgency of art in society, a sense of the political. This obviously also comes from the legacy of Joseph Beuys, whose 7,000 oaks were planted and therefore spearheading many of the ecological and environmental policies that are enacted today all over the world which is another proof that art really does have effects in the world. Uh, but uh, what is the political? I do not use that word lightly. Where is it constituted? Is it the space where I appear to others and others appear to me? This is the space required for politics to occur, but it is also the space that politics gives rise to, as Hannah Arendt teaches. And yet, this space cannot be the polis, as the old Greek term indicated, as that would simply imply that those without appearance are stateless, such as dogs, voiceless, excluded, and that means animals, plants, and minerals. It is, I believe, the space of the preservation of life on the planet, as Judith Butler says, 
and political life is the exercise of freedom in concert with others. If it is concerned with the preservation of life on the planet, then it implies that an engaged form of art is related to healing and processes of healing, suturing wounds and separations, destructions of life, modes of alliance that exceed both liberal and communitarian models. It can affect conflict, whether internal, interpersonal, societal, both imagining alternatives and withdrawing from it, and thus depotentiating it, poised as it is on the edge between the almost singular expression of the almost private sphere and the broader webs of subjectivities that it is instantiated by and that it contemporaneously instantiates. I think I should show you a few pictures before you get too bored. <laughs> so that's Darcy in the digital age. And I did not take this picture for this conference. It's actually Darcy likes to hang onto my old laptop now that I rarely use a laptop, uh, in any case. Uh, Caroline's shadow. Yes, Caroline's shadow. And by the way, it's also the Maltese dog, which is indigenous to the Mediterranean. Indigenous, therefore, um, was the dog most loved by the ancient Romans. And uh, I lived most of my time in Italy. My, my formation was with the Arte Povera artists who emerged in the 1960s in, in, in antithesis to consumer culture at the time. Uh, and so it is a dog, it's a local dog. It's not some exotic pet from very far and very expensive. And it is also the model for two minutes. Two minutes? Yeah. Okay, two minutes. It's also the model for Goya, of course, the little dog of Goya. Well, that said, I think I'll just show you the slides, and I won't tell you anything about Documenta 13, but that's okay, because you can come to another lecture, um, because we have so many people here um, that I cannot, we don't have time to say anything about Documenta 13, but that's okay. Uh, what I do as an artist is take an ordinary object, say a lamppost, and by urinating on it, transform it into something that is uniquely my own. That's from Newsweek or New York Times, okay. Now, this is Margaret Preston with her dog. Margaret Preston is the first, um, she was a woman in Australia in the 1920s and 30s. The first modern, one of the founders of modernism in one of the peripheral areas of the world. And she indeed was also the person closest to looking at indigenous philosophies and indigenous art with a non-exoticist attitude. Um, indeed, basically, to say in a nutshell what I'm interested in, because I can't read this whole paper to you, I'm interested in a worldly alliance that de-anthropocentricizes culture, which means that moves us away from thinking that the human is particularly central. And that's why I'm not particularly interested in old feminist views, but I'm interested in the feminism that has developed into theories around multi-species co-evolution. Uh, and I think of it as a feminist project because the other is not just a woman, the other is many, 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 many other forms of other. But I am interested in an alliance between the ad most advanced research in knowledge, fundamental research in quantum physics, for example, and those knowledges, those local indigenous knowledges that, uh, for example, indigenous aboriginal uh, peoples in the central desert of Australia have around water policy and land, uh, taking care of land and so on. So that's where I used to work. That's uh, Maurizio Catalan, some of you know. <laughs> this a little bit of art. I was going to comment all of this. This is a painting from the 19th century by Edouard Manet. It's Le Bal Masqué à l'Opéra. And I will tell you next June when we open Documenta why it's in this slideshow. But as you can see, the woman is... Uh, the woman is uh, pulling herself out of the painting and creating a dialogue with the viewer and, and just pulling herself out by both veiling herself, indeed. She's avoiding the gaze and the objective uh, uh, that the other girl that's not veiled is doing, and so on and so forth. So I see Manet as a feminist. Anyway, that's Henri Sala, mixed behavior. Uh, a contemporary artist uh, I find very interesting. And this is the last big project that I did, and I'll conclude with that. 
Uh, when I was the director of the Sydney Biennale in Australia uh, some years ago, uh, Pierre Huyg asked me uh, to do a one-night installation. And this one-night installation, the time that it takes a large candle to burn, so absolutely not in market marketable as an object, as, a, as, a, as an artwork, uh, for one night to create a forest inside the Sydney Opera House and a folk singer would, uh, would like a Pied Piper sang and the viewers were wearing, um, they were wearing miners headlights on their foreheads so the viewers were both looking through the paths of the forest as well as becoming fireflies in this very, very beautiful and poetic installation. Had it lasted more than 24 hours, it would have bec been a, a, a heavy, horrible thing about power. <laughs> and and, the, and, and uh, I find politically problematic. By lasting one night, it was an apparition. But it was done thanks to the labors and the commitment of so many people, a hundred volunteers who in eight hours removed 2,000 chairs of the Sydney Opera House Concert Hall, uh, uh, yes, Concert Hall, brought in plastic, covered the floors, brought in 2,000 trees with earth on them, you know, under them, not cut, no trees were cut. The whole thing was done. In 24 hours, the room was cleared and the concert was held perfectly without even a cricket having remained to disturb the next day's concert. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>